I'm learning to juggle so that when I get when I get really good at juggling, I'm going to have 14 glass balls slightly filled with a gaseous liquid. It's just slightly heavier than air. And it'll be blue, sky blue, so that when I juggle them, they'll be totally invisible. So why would a person make something so amateurish and goofy, but not really funny, what was this person thinking about? In order to answer that, I have to consider this period of time in my development as an artist, and here I have to confess to a secret obsession. For months in 1972, I had been secretly reading as many back issues of Avalanche magazine as I could get my hands on. They were, they were sort of stored in the office at uh, A-Space. I hadn't seen this magazine before. And this is changing my orientation to the world around me. Avalanche Magazine, edited by the late Willoughby Sharp and Liza Baer, was a smart and maddeningly male getaway into what was happening in New York, into the New York art scene at that time. And I wanted to know. Now I have a caveat here. Avalanche was also the first place that I read about Laurie Anderson, Yvonne Rayner, and Meredith Monk. So it wasn't all male, just mostly male. You may be guessing why I was reading Avalanche, a celebration of all things male in the New York art world in secret. Well, you see, I was a committed, some might say rabid, I say vocal, feminist at the time. And I belonged to, the women's, to a women's photography collective. We just juried an enormous exhibition of Canadian women's photography the first in Canada, and we were touring it to several cities. And I was feverishly consuming the entire canon of feminist literature, from Simone de Beauvoir to Shulamith Firestone on my own. So I was really, I was hopped up about this whole issue. And then there was the art world. So almost in spite of the overwhelmingly male faces that graced the covers of Avalanche and voices that you read inside, the kind of work that was featured in this magazine seemed both foreign and wonderful to me. It was art of the mind, an art that was informed by words and thought, not determined by the maker's technical skill, but rather by the elegance of the thought itself. And it was around this time that I heard a lecture by Jack Burnham on Marcel Duchamp and first heard of Duchamp's famous dictum, art as idea. In writing about conceptual art, U.S. Cr uh, critic Roberta Smith says, uh, quote, this, is, this was about to become art as philosophy, as information, as linguistics, as mathematics, as autobiography, as social criticism, as life risking, as joke, as storytelling. In reading these back issues of Avalanche, I learned that art was anything the artist said it was. The artist counting, making marks, standing, biting, sleeping, masturbating, measuring, any number of processes and tasks that were not formerly undertaken as or named art. Here's some iconic work by Joseph Kosuth, someone we just love to look at. Not one of the more visual of our visual artists, but, um, and he was a regular at this point in Avalanche magazine. He wasn't one of my favorites, but he's very important and very influential. So in 69, Joseph Kosuth wrote, this piece is called Art as Idea as Idea, bracket, painting. Um, he wrote, my first use of the term proposition for my work was when I began my Art as Idea as Idea series in 1966. The photostatic blow up, I think that means a sort of early Xerox, a photostat, I guess. The photostatic blow-ups weren't supposed to be considered paintings or sculpture or even works in the usual sense, with the point being there was art as idea. So I referred to the physical material of the blow-up as the work's form of presentation and referred to the art entity as a proposition, a term I borrowed from linguistic philosophy." Unquote. And these were, dis these were displayed just as this very low uh, resolution object you see here before you. It didn't look much better than this. This is not a bad slide, this is an accurate slide. This is a very famous work of uh, Joseph Kosuth, One and Three Chairs. 
And this gives you a good idea of how far um, Kossuth would take conceptualism. This piece consists of the idea that all three of these are, in fact, the chair, the dictionary definition, the photograph of the chair, and the actual physical chair are equivalents. With this piece, Kossuth gives us the idea only. If you wanted to exhibit one and three chairs, you got a page of instructions from the, from the artist signed by him, and as the exhibitor, it was your job to follow the instructions. And he loved this because every place was different. So they would go and get their own chair, then they'd have to take their own picture of the chair. And um, so each work actually, the only thing that was the artist's work was the idea itself. But back to juggling. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to play it again. Um, the strange performance work I showed you earlier. This work, my first videotape, began a series of works that lasted until 1976 when I began to do more scripted narrative work. All of these works are trying to discover and maybe even reveal how we come to know something, how we acquire knowledge of something, be it an activity, and in that case it was juggling, or an object, or a person, or ourselves. And I approached this question very bluntly. In juggling, I'm quite literally practicing on camera. I'm not very good at it. And the viewer does see me actually make a little bit of progress. At 3 minutes and 15 seconds, I actually hold on to it for a little while. I'm kind of OK there for a while before it gets away from me again. And this is very, the acquisition of any technical skill, I think, is very common to all of us that we would. You get a little bit better. You get kind of reach that. And then maybe you even, then you plateau. And then you usually fall back unless you're a professional juggler. That's my story. So, and I can, you know, in other, wor in other works from this time period, I read from children's books about earthworms or the human sleep cycle, or in uh, the ne case of the next work, uh, turtles. I'm going to show you an excerpt of, uh, of a work entitled Know Your Turtle. It was made in 1972. It's 22 minutes long, don't worry. All right, excerpt short. Um, I was exploring the idea of the transmission of information and knowledge, but I added the element of chance to it, something I was also very interested in assigning to my time-based projects at this point. This involved a camera person moving between three rooms of a Toronto apartment. There was a sound recordist in the fourth room who took a live feed, uh, audio feed from all three rooms and mixed them independently of where the camera was. So he didn't know where the camera was. Um, so we've got one recording, one audio track, but it's being mixed from these three sources. And the camera is physically moving from room to room. Um, in the first room, a young woman does a flat, uninflected reading from an instructional, ma instructional manual uh, about raising domestic turtles. And next door, in the bathroom, I am running a bath using a thermometer to set the temperature. You can imagine what's going to happen there. And then in the third room, two aquariums are set up, each one containing a swimming turtle. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what happens. The, uh, the reader is reading about um, how you need to um, contact your local wildlife uh, federation if you're going to go capturing turtles in the wild. Meanwhile, I am in the bathtub with the turtle, with the one turtle. Um, and I've transferred the small turtle into the big turtle's tank and I've got the big turtle in the in the bath with me and the turtle is heading for you can imagine um, what looks to him like a forest underwater anyway it's I think it's the only moment of excitement in the 22 minute uh, work I encourage you to, to seek this out at V tape it's a it's a an unknown masterpiece